everyone. My name is Maria Thomas, and I work for Allianz Research, the global team of economists, strategists, sector advisors, and foresight experts of the Allianz Group, led by Ludovic Subron. Welcome to Tomorrow, a podcast where we'll be talking about our latest analyses of economic and capital market developments, as well as our views on trends affecting risk management. Let's get started. Over the last decades, and especially since the global financial crisis, structural factors have held down inflation. But now that trend is reversing. In this episode with Andreas Jobst, Head of Macroeconomic and Capital Markets Research, and Anu Kuanathan, Head of Corporate Research, we find out more about the five Ds of structurally higher inflation. Hello, Andy and Anu. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Maria. Thanks for having me. Hi, Maria. So over the last decades, inflation has been steadily trending down. And in your recent paper, you write that structural factors were responsible for holding down inflation. Can you tell us more about these factors? Sure, absolutely. Inflation is driven by both cyclical and structural factors. And the inflation rate, uh, the way we measure changes of prices, that is based on a broad basket of uh, consumption goods and services, the Commodity prices, food prices uh, tend to be more cyclical uh, and as a result of which there are more volatile inflation components. They influence inflation temporarily. However, inflation dynamics are also influenced by gradual changes in structural factors. And these structural factors we explored in the paper have caused a secular decline of inflation over the last decades. Uh, These secular factors or excuse me, structural factors, um, can be driven by domestic developments. Um, Think of aging populations where um, uh, there is a higher propensity to save, right? Because people grow older, they consume less. Uh, But also in societies where debt is rising, uh, households, companies uh, load up on debt. And if you have more debt, um, then you like inflation because inflation will reduce your debt burden in real terms. Structural factors could also be externally driven. Um, Increasing trade uh, and greater integration of labor markets uh, through trade relationships um, can uh, bring down the cost uh, of production because uh, capital and labor becomes cheaper. uh, And that's the hallmark really of the disinflationary impact of globalization we've seen. Um, given that the structural factors uh, evolve gradually, uh, they also are more persistent in nature. And uh, their impact on inflation is more longer lasting. That means also that their impact on inflation dynamics uh, materially impacts inflation over very long time horizons. We've looked at the data from inflation data from uh, OECD countries uh, over the last 20, 25 years. And what we can see uh, prior to the pandemic and the war in Ukraine is that declining labor productivity, uh, a shrinking workforce, higher financial leverage in economies, and a greater integration of trade uh, do have a distinctly disinflationary impact. And uh, this impact has become more important over time. So now the trend in inflation has clearly reversed, but you argue that beyond the cyclical factors coming from the consequences of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, structural factors will again play a role, only this time more in the opposite direction. Why is that? Absolutely, Maria. So as you mentioned, um, with uh, the the post-COVID uh, issues that we had with global supply chains and also uh, the negative shock of the Ukraine war, uh, inflation came back to the to the front of the of the headlines. Uh, but in our report, we argue that uh, beyond those cyclical factors, some of the uh, structural factors that Andy just mentioned. Are actually going to uh, play uh, on the on the opposite side, meaning that, uh, for example, uh, demographics uh, that w- that tend to to decrease uh, inflation over the last couple of decades is actually going to put um, uh, upward pressure on prices going forward. Um, globalization 
is currently uh, being a bit reversed. Um, decarbonation is also going to, to play a role uh, in, in probably uh, upward pressuring uh, prices. Uh, and then there's also uh, digitalization and debt uh, that we think uh, will play uh, an inflationary role going forward. Okay, so can we talk about each of these factors in details? What can you tell us about each of the five Ds? I think the most interesting D is demographics because that structural factor has been with us for a long time. And in our assessment, it will become ever more important. Also interesting here is that we've got the tug of war between two opposing forces, one inflationary, one disinflationary. Uh, On the one hand, we... In an aging society, uh, we have uh, a reduced supply of labor, uh, and that could push up wages. But at the same time, uh, in aging societies, uh, we also see a weakening of the dynamism of the economy. And so imagine this, if the elderly spend less money on goods and services, that weakens demand. and productivity, and that puts a dampener on, you know, the incentives to invest into the future. Because if you have a, a outlook, a poor outlook of the future, then uh, that negative uh, sentiment carries into, you know, a, a suboptimal um, investment strategy. So overall, we in the past we've seen a net disinflationary impact uh, of demographics. But going forward, given the dislocations in labor markets due to the pandemic and the energy crisis, there might as well be a net inflationary impact uh, when it comes to uh, the adverse demographics going forward, uh, especially you know, in, in advanced economies. The, the second D is decarbonization. Uh, and that is a more recent D, if you will, because the fact that we need to have a, a credibly progressive and increasing carbon prices. That realization uh, has only come to the fore over the last three or four years when countries become more committed to a credible uh, climate change uh, policy stance. And how does that factor into inflation? Well, higher carbon taxes uh, will raise uh, the price for fossil energy uh, to drive down uh, the demand uh, for those sources of energy uh, and promote at the same time the use of uh, climate neutral alternatives. So in in plain English, what this means is that fossil fuels will become more expensive to make renewable energy sources more attractive. But it also means that in during this time of adjustment, we call that relative price adjustment, uh, the the consumer and uh, companies will have to foot the bill uh, through higher energy prices. Uh, households have to pay for the electricity, for uh, uh, fossil fuel they use to heat their homes. Uh, and at the same time, we also see production becoming more expensive because the energy required uh, to uh, produce uh, will become more expensive until companies switch their sources of energy to renewable sources. And then the last D I would mention uh, is that uh, rising leverage in economies can lead to structurally high inflation. Um, And that uh, that risk of that pushing up inflation has increased, steadily increased, uh, because public and private debt have increased significantly over the last decade. Uh, Now, global public and private debt amount to about 350% of GDP. And uh, if you, as an individual, as a business, as a government, if you're heavily indebted, then you're also more willing to tolerate high inflation because, as I mentioned at the outset, high inflation reduces your debt burden in real terms. Uh, particularly higher government borrowing uh, could create a, a negative feedback loop between uh, higher debt and higher inflation. If a government borrows more money, 
by issuing bonds, by borrowing from banks, they increase money supply. And that can lead to high inflation if demand for goods and services remains unchanged. At the same time, what's more is that high government borrowing can also lead to high interest rates. And uh, if the cost of borrow goes up, uh, it might fuel inflation um, because the financing conditions for households and firms have become uh, most rigid. Cool. Over to you, Ado. Among the remaining Ds uh, that we that we identify in our report, um, we uh, we underline the role of deglobalization. Um, so when we talk about deglobalization, we're not strictly speaking about the full reversal of, of globalization, uh, but we are clearly seeing that the recent trend is uh, moving away from the hyper globalization period that we lived in from the 80s to the late 2000s. Uh, basically, what it means is that uh, the trade in, uh, and the flows in terms of, of goods uh, has been leveling out, um, and we are seeing a slowdown in terms of global trade uh, as a share of, of global GDP. And uh, this is due to, to, to a number of factors. Uh, the fact that um, corporates have been looking for uh, more uh, efficiency and not uh, only uh, to, uh, to to cut costs, but also to, to be resilient uh, in terms of their supply chains. Uh, there are also uh, obviously some geopolitical tensions uh, that are that is also putting uh, a lead uh, on on global trade and on on the on, on this trend of, of globalization, uh, especially the uh, the U.S. China tensions uh, that have been uh, around since uh, since the Trump administration, which have been weighing on, um, on on global trade, and so this slowing down of globalization uh, could definitely have an inflationary impact uh, through uh, through either uh, reshoring, nearshoring that would be much costlier than uh, than having production made uh, in Asia or in China, for example. Uh, or also, uh, if you think about uh, protectionist measures, such as uh, higher tariffs, uh, that could also lead to uh, more uh, inflation uh, from, from imported goods. So uh, overall, we, we feel that uh, this uh, reversal of, of globalization uh, could, could have a, an inflationary impact for, uh, for the consumer. Another uh, factor, or uh, structural factor, that has been uh, reported over the last 20 years as weighing down on prices uh, could actually play uh, in the opposite direction uh, in the coming year, and that's uh, digitalization. Um, why do we say that? Uh, it's mostly because um, we've noticed that uh, during the pandemic, um, the, uh, the, the increases in prices um, in digital retail uh, were actually higher than uh, in physical retail, uh, meaning that in a period where uh, the uh, the online retailers had the upper hand, uh, they raised prices more uh, than their physical uh, competition. Uh, another uh, another factor where uh, we see that uh, this uh, this fa- this factor of um, downward pressure from digital is also going to uh, to fade is the fact that uh, digital business model uh, have been shifting away uh, from growth strategy to profitability meaning that uh, digital players were uh, focused on growing uh, at all costs uh, but now uh, they seem to be uh, more focusing on, on reaching profitability and uh, one straightforward way to uh, to reach profitability uh, when you have a huge market share uh, and uh, loyal customers is to increase prices. Um, and, and the final risk that we identify on the, on the digital front is related to the rise of data. Um, large digital players have um, harvested huge amounts of data and those data could be very effective if they were to implement uh, price discrimination strategies. Uh, so far, there is no evidence of such practice, uh, but in theory, they could be implemented and most regulators do not have the human or the technical capacity to, to monitor those practices. So this is also something that we will be looking closely uh, and monitoring over the, over the next few years. What are the policy implications of this new phase? 
I think I would put first monetary policy, even though monetary policy is really um, at the mercy of fiscal policy when it comes to combating structurally high inflation. Uh, central banks will need to be better prepared to handle structurally high inflation, especially if it's fueled by supply-side shocks. We've seen a supply-side shock uh, during the pandemic when you know uh, the increased cost of transportation, uh, the um, supply chain constraints have pushed up the cost of intermediate goods and so on. And we've seen also another supply side shock um, in the form of high energy prices. And going forward, most likely we also see um, a negative supply side shock from high energy prices due to uh, a credible climate change policy. Uh, what central banks uh, um, can do is create the conditions, uh, the financing conditions, if you will, uh, that would sponsor um, a investments that raise productivity because higher productivity will also lift what we call the neutral rate and that would make it easier for the central bank to fight inflation effectively without running the risk of plunging the economy into recession if they raise rates uh, for the sake of fighting inflation that's driven by the supply side. Uh, the, the more direct way in which central bank can tackle structurally high inflation would be to raise the inflation target. So changing the mandate um, uh, and doing so uh, consistent with the new reality of what we claim to be an uh, environment with structurally high inflation. But that's not easy. Um, we've done uh, fairly well over the last um, 30, 40 years with uh, more and more central banks adopting an inflation targeting regime. And if you raise the inflation target, uh, you, you put a uh, more burden on poorer households that have uh, less disposable income. Uh, and uh, as a result of which, monetary policy becomes even more um, uh, impactful when it comes to uh, its uh, distributional impact. So not easy. Uh, the more powerful lever for structurally high inflation, in my view, is fiscal policy. Uh, and in this regard, it would need to become uh, more targeted and redistributive uh, uh, when it comes to uh, you know, the current crisis, uh, high energy cost. Uh, and over the medium and long term, uh, fiscal policy wouldn't shift towards growth enhancing um, support. Uh, and that could, you know, for instance, be uh, by boosting productivity growth uh, through more public investment in infrastructure that's got a lot of embedded innovation uh, in a result of which can raise productivity, um, but also supporting emerging technologies uh, uh, to make them price competitive. Uh, they could also aid the green transition if it's in uh, technology uh, uh, aiding um, low emission transport, uh, energy efficiency, and so on. And there's also you know, fiscal policy supporting uh, structural uh, reforms, uh, such as helping the labor force upskill, reskill to the new reality of a um, economy and society that needs to become greener and more sustainable in both consumption and investment. But overall, what we see uh, cyclically that fiscal policy would need to um, be more targeted such that the support we see at the moment for um, households and firms uh, in dealing with high energy prices uh, does not leak into pushing up aggregate demand above and beyond what's required to um, reduce the risk of households and uh, companies hurting excessively, such that you know we don't, uh, as fiscal policymakers, don't work against uh, the central bank in fighting inflation by by raising demand at a time when demand adjustment is required to bring down 
prices. Thank you very much, Andy and Anu. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the full report we just spoke about on our website. We'll leave a link in the show notes. If you'd like to discover more of our research, you can also follow the Ludonomics newsletter on LinkedIn. We'll leave a link down below for that too. If you like the podcast, please send it to any of your friends who might like it too, and leave us a rating and a review. We'd love to hear your feedback. In the meantime, stay tuned for the next episode.